I'm privileged today to introduce my mom, Matushka Olga Sokic. I'm amazed at what she's accomplished in her 90 years on this earth so far, but one of the most amazing things is to get to know who is now Saint Nikolai. How many people can say, I knew a saint, I spoke with a saint. He was her spiritual leader. It was just amazing to hear the stories and then to have her prepare this and have, have you listened to this so you can share in some of her life experiences with Saint Nikolai. Imagine that. It could be how many people? I knew a saint before he was a saint, but I knew, I knew him. It's the Bishop Nikolai. So I would like to stop talking and introduce my mom, Matuska Olga Sokic. I thank you for this opportunity to talk with you about my connection with St. Nikolai Velomirovich. There are very, very few people alive today who have had the spiritual privilege of speaking with a saint, and I am one of those fortunate people. I'll talk with you this evening, beginning with my upbringing in the Orthodox Church, how I met St. Nikolai, and how my personal experiences with him changed my life. My family and I were attending the St. Sava Serbian Orthodox Cathedral Church in New York City on 25th Street. This big church was a historic building because it was built in the 1890s. There were, that was really horse and buggy days. About 1,500 people could fit into this big cathedral. My father, my mother, and my three brothers and I attended mostly on Sunday for the Holy Liturgy. Everything was spoken in Serbian. The sermon, the responses by the choir were in church Slavonic. And I, of course, did not speak of speak Serbian or understand Serbian. So what was I supposed to do? I was about, I think, eight or 10 years old. My mind would wander during the services. I was an Orthodox Christian. I would see the priest go in one door and out another door, sometimes in the center door where the royal doors were leading to the altar were open, and sometimes on the side door. I didn't know and I didn't understand. When it was time for the people to receive Holy Communion, many times I would cry quietly, standing or sitting in the pews, because I simply didn't understand what was going on. And I wanted to know. I wanted to know more about Orthodoxy, but I knew very little. I went to several libraries, but not enough information was available for me to read and educate myself. The Serbian priests always seemed to be so busy and could not answer any of my questions or even give me any books about orthodoxy. I was left to find out for myself. I believe it was 1947, 48, when I was about 17 years old, I heard that a Serbian bishop who could not go back to Serbia after World War II would be coming to New York. I heard he was also in a concentration camp in Dachau in Germany. When he was, he got a little sick there too. And when he was free, he attended Dorchester and Oxford University in England. He did speak about eight languages. Imagine speaking eight languages. How many do you speak? How many do I speak? It was there where he met my future husband and also became close friends with Bishop Manning of the Episcopal Church. It was this friendship that helped the Serbs purchase the cathedral in New York City. When he left England, he brought six students with him to study at St. Vladimir's, all on scholarship. My future husband, Dragoljub Sokic, was one of these students. The name Dragoljub means their love, that's for me. I was told that this bishop was coming to St. Thomas and he would live in this special apartment next door to the church. And they were not really being used. The priest and his family was able to be in one. I thought that was great because if this bishop could speak English, of course he could, I would ask him about orthodoxy. 
It was Sunday of Orthodoxy that the cathedral was to hold the Sunday Vesper services and other ethnic Orthodox faithful would attend. Every year, one Orthodox church was chosen, and this church was chosen. Since there were many different ethnic groups going to be in attendance, that meant the service would be in English. There would be Serbs, Greeks, Russians, Bulgarians, and others. Bishop Nikolai was already serving in this cathedral and be one to speak in English, greeting all these Orthodox people and priests. My family attended, and I waited anxiously to see what was going to happen when the bishop walked up the huge podium. He didn't use the little one. He used the one all the way up high, and he looked at the people. He looked to the left. He looked to the right, and he smiled, and he said, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I greet you all. Before he began to speak, this is what he said. He had welcomed the people. I listened carefully to his words of wisdom. Tears filled my eyes, and I felt a spiritual uplifting in my heart and soul. He would not speak long, but I remember being moved by his words of wisdom. When the service was over, I knew what I had to do. I had to get up enough nerve to visit this special bishop in his quarters. Excuse me. After the service, the women's club would prepare a nice snack or meal for the families who wanted to eat before heading on. They came from long distances. One Sunday, I got up the courage and decided to stay after the service and talk with Bishop Nikolai. I told my parents that I was going to stay a little longer after church and speak with someone and welcome him and come home later. I did not tell him where I was going. I think if my father knew, he'd probably say, come, no. <laughs> I waited until the kitchen cook brought Nikolai something to eat and thought about him resting a little. I nervously approached his, his door. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He slowly opened the door, looked down, and he said, my child, what can I do for you? I, I need your help. My dear young child, would you come in? Would you like a cup of tea? Imagine the bishop asking me for a cup of tea. And I said, no thank you, Your Grace. All I want is to ask you if you had any books I could borrow and read about Orthodox. That's all you want? Yes, Your Grace. You see, I'm an Orthodox, and I could not seem to find what I need in some of the libraries I went to. I was born an Orthodox and I need to know more. Well, my dear child, he began, it's not a problem because I can give you a couple of books you may borrow to read, but I have a better idea to help you. Now just listen, <laughs> listen carefully. You must go and attend St. Vladimir Seminary and register as a non-matriculated student and take several courses there, then come and visit me after the classes and we can talk more. Your Grace, I must tell you that I'm already enrolled as a student at a college, already on a scholarship. Then he looked at me and he opened up his big eyes and he said, so what? <laughs> Just make time. Where do you live? I told him that I lived in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Your Grace, I do know that St. Vladimir's is on 110th Street in New York City, in Manhattan. That's fine, just go and we will talk after you have finished several semesters. I got up, I thanked him, kissed his hand, and left for home. There was a lot for me to think about. I found myself feeling like a heavy burden lifted off because I would finally get the answers I had been searching for for so long. Could I do this? Many times I saw the sun rise and set in the same day because of all that I had to do. Many times the bishop would travel to different churches. After all, he was a bishop in that did not have a home parish. He visited St. Vlad's and also St. Tihon's Monastery in Pennsylvania. He always wanted all the ethnic Orthodox to be under one umbrella. I was told that he said this in the 1930s. 
And I actually heard him say that in the late 1940s. United, we stand. Divided, we fall. You know who else said that? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I thought somebody would say something. <laughs> I'm not too old, but I'm okay. I enrolled at St. Vlas and was so pleased I took Bishop Nikolai's advice. The courses were certainly an eye-opener. I attended sessions given by Reverend Alexander Schmemann, Florovsky, Hopgood, and uh, Meindorf, and the very Reverend George Florovsky. Florovsky had a very heaven German accent, but he spoke English well. He would give assignments and ask the students to answer the questions and to be placed on his desk after completion. We usually had two days to complete the work. Professor Sophie Kolomzin also taught courses on how to teach children about orthodoxy and the holy liturgy, and I still have one of her books. During my time attending the courses, I met Dragoljub Sokic. Dragoljub, as I told you, means dear love. And Bishop said, I can't call you Dragoljub. I can't call you dear love. I'll call you Sokol. So that's what he did. He called him Sokol. We spent much time together on the days attending classes, talking about orthodoxy and the impact Nikoli had on both of our young lives. Of course, we also spoke about other topics as well. Later, during one of our conversations, I told Bishop Nikolai that I was falling in love with one of the six students he brought with him from England. No way was I ready to marry anyone, much less a foreigner. I needed to finish college, get a job, become self-supporting, so that a husband didn't have to support me. Who wanted a husband to support you? <laughs> but sometimes things change. When Bishop heard that I had said what I had said, he was not surprised. And he said, male or female? Is this person you met male or female? <laughs> and I said, male. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> so he called us together, and he sat us down. And he said, Sola, as I called him, or Soka, as Bishop called him, had been on the path to become a monk. And Bishop knew this, but now that was all about to change. Sola was Bishop Nikolai's private secretary for the last six years of his life. So he knew all his business. And Bishop got so many thousands of dollars that he sent away. Then he spoke to both of us. You must both be very sure of your feelings. I would suggest that you, Soko, go away to visit my friend, a priest in Buffalo, and stay there for the whole summer. There is to be absolutely no communication or letters between you and Olga, nothing. If you do feel that you want to talk to each other, write down your thoughts and then exchange them when you come back. If you both have reached the same point of no return, I really want to be married. I will do the honor for you both. I also will give you both some honest advice. When Sola came back from Buffalo, he decided that we had reached the point of no return. We both met, met with Bishop Nicola in his apartment, and he said, remember, my dear Olga, one day your beloved Sola will be ordained and perhaps even have a parish to take care of. Then there will be a responsibility 24-7 to help and guide the parishioners. And you, as his wife, will also need 24-7 attention. He can't forget about you. And when you are blessed with children, there's another responsibility for both of you. Remember, Ola, you will not be married to a priest. You'll be married to a man. You will also need to be watchful in the parish and to be the eyes and ears to help out. He can't see everything. I love you both and you have my blessing. Once we decided to get married, we did not want to wait. So we found an apartment on 91st Street and Central Park Avenue, Central Park West. And it was May 31st, 1953, to be joined together. Unfortunately, Bishop was called away and could not perform the service, but he gave us his blessing. He did say, now listen to this, he did say, marriages are made in heaven. As soon as the couple agrees to be together, the church service does the rest. 
My advice to you is pack a suitcase, pack your clothes, get changed when everything is all over, in, in, if you have a reception or anything, and take that suitcase and go on your honeymoon right away. Don't wait. If you wait a week or two or a month, it's not the same. How did he know that? Well, that's what he said. And we were married on that rainy day in the St. Sava Serbian Orthodox Church, cathedral actually, with uh, Father Schmemann and parish priest officiating. My father did not want me to marry Saul. Some things never change. He was still angry with me and didn't want, want to walk me down the aisle. He stayed in the very back of the church. So my brother Boris walked me down the aisle. Bishop Nicolai knew about my father not approving of this marriage. And the advice he told us to remember the commandment, love your father and mother and honor your father and mother. I told the bishop, I did not hate my father for that, but I was very disappointed and sad that he made that choice. The next advice Bishop Nicola gave us was that not to postpone the honeymoon. That, to me, was something. We followed his advice, and he was right. Shortly after we came back from the honeymoon, Bishop showed us a letter from the church council telling Bishop Nikolai to leave the cathedral and go to Libertyville, Illinois at the seminary. Well, Bishop Nikolai was just annoyed and he said that since he was a bishop with no parish, he could go wherever he wanted. He then said, he showed us the letter, I'm going to my Russian friends at St. Tihon's, and that's where he went. It was decided, someone came and drove the bishop to the seminary. Of course, at the seminary, everyone was more than pleased to have Bishop Nikolai there with them. They had reserved a special room for him. Later, he became their dean and taught many classes at the seminary. Even though Bishop Nikolai was all settled at St. Tihon's Monastery, he still came to St. Sava Serbian Cathedral in New York City every Easter week. He was there on Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, and Monday. Two years later, I became pregnant. I was not feeling well that Easter, and I said to my husband, you have to go and direct the choir. By the way, my husband couldn't read a note. <laughs> he couldn't read a note, but he knew. But he knew how to direct the choir. He knew the intonation. He just went like this and da 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 da, and and it was beautiful. And I said to myself, "But don't you want to learn?" He said, "Learn what? I know it." <laughs> okay. He served with the priest, and my soul directed the choir. My mother was with me. I already. Was re I was ready to go to the hospital. Before I left the apartment, I called the cathedral hall and one of the choir members answered, and I told her to tell my Sola where I was going and to come to the hospital when he was finished with the service. I told her, please do not tell him until the service is over because he'll be nervous. We don't want him to be nervous. At the very end of the service, Bishop Nikolai approached Sola and told him, Go to the hospital, doctor's hospital in New York immediately. Your wife, Olga, just gave birth to a little girl. How did he know? Nobody told him. But then again, it's Nikolai. Christ is risen. I love you, Soka. Go now. How is it possible that he knew my daughter was born? No one told him. Almost one year after the birth of my daughter, on March 17th, shortly after Holy Liturgy, Nikolai had passed on. I was very upset. I no longer had my mentor who inspired me and guided me to have an understanding of orthodoxy. Who would be able to answer my questions and provide guidance? The death of Nikolai was quite sudden. When he heard about it, Sola wanted to go to the monastery as quickly as possible. I remember the unusual forecast of a snowstorm coming up the coast. Saul told me to go home with our little daughter, Donitsa, because he was going to try his luck with a prayer to get to the monastery by bus. It was about 100 and, 
maybe 120 miles away. He said that as soon as he arrived at the seminary, he would call me. We embraced, and he asked my father, imagine, for some money, and my father gave him $40. We hugged him, and he said, be careful. He caught the last bus to Pennsylvania before the storm. When he finally reached Scranton, he called a monk he knew and asked him to pick him up. They soon arrived at the seminary. Sola told the monk that he had to get into Bishop's room immediately to get a portfolio. When they reached the room, it was sealed. After the priest had gone through it, and when they found Nicola, he was on his knees, and they picked him up and put him on the bed, and then they sealed the door so nobody could go in. They both carefully removed the plastic tape, both Sola and this monk. They went into the room and knew exactly where the portfolio was, and it was there. Sola also noticed that the room was a bit messy, and certain drawers from the dresser were on the floor. There was no time to think about that. Someone had been in there looking for something. They found out later what it was. Both Saul and the monk quietly put back the plastic covering over the door. Saul went with the monk to his room, gave him the portfolio, and told him to put it under his pillow. And after the funeral of Bishop Nicolai, he would get it and bring it home. Just imagine that. Nikolai wanted the portfolio to be hand-delivered to a certain monk at Mount Athos in Greece. How was Saul to do this? He was not going to Greece. It was something to think about and pray for God. It took a little time, but the portfolio was hand-delivered, and Zola received a letter of confirmation. confirmation. Bishop Nikolai had written two books in Serbia, The Only Lover of Mankind and The Harvest of the Lord. Sola knew that Nikolai wanted him to translate those two books into English so the messages could be reach many people, especially the Serbian people in the United States. I was excited when they were completed because I could read the words of wisdom from my mentor. When both books were finally printed in English, there were only a few copies available. I remember reading those two books, how inspiring they were. I do remember I did take the copy of each of them when we moved, and I moved from our home. Somehow, I misplaced the books. I still can't find them. Perhaps our Serbian bishop, Irene Zubrivic, have has a copy of each of these books in English that I can borrow. Again, I'm borrowing books. <laughs> there was more personal experience that I would like to share with you. Several years ago, a few of my friends got together and decided to write a book contending, containing stories about how war changed their lives. Sharing experiences through the eyes of the women, not the soldiers, my story explained as a result of the war. Nikolai and my future husband was forced out of Serbia. Nikolai later got to know my future husband and brought him as one of the six students to study theology in America, all on a scholarship. The book is called Wives' Tales, Looking Back, How War Changed Our Lives. It was finally ready to be published. I was excited and I knew I had to have a good night's sleep. That night I woke up around 2.20 and felt a presence in my room. I got up and sat at the edge of the bed. All of a sudden, I heard someone call my name. Olga, Olga, in your story in the book Wives' Tales, My Destiny, you spoke of a Bishop Nicolai. You must add my last name to that because there are many Bishop Nicolais, many Bishop Nicholases, but only one Bishop Nikolai Velomirovich. And make sure, make sure you spell the last name correctly. <laughs> I was shocked. And immediately I said, this is, this is Nikolai, but he's gone. He died several years ago. But it was him. And we had sent the manuscript to a professor at um, the, the university in Canada. And she was ready to send it to her friend to be published. After all, I knew and gave birth to a daughter on that Easter Sunday. And no one told him. How did he know? I truly believe that he must, of course, already be in the kingdom of heaven. We are guided in so many ways 
and must let God guide our lives. As I reflect back to those wonderful years that I spent with Nikolai, I find that his inspirations truly guided me. When my husband was assigned to his parish, I made myself available to teach Sunday school classes to the children. I felt that it was my calling to do this for those young minds about orthodoxy. I wanted to make sure that the children did not feel lost as I did when I was a child attending services. I had the desire to educate them and so they had an understanding of importance and made sure there were books available in English during the service for them to follow. Knowing Bishop Nicolai truly changed my life. St. Tihon's Monastery now is in the process of creating a shrine for him. It has been my pleasure to share this evening with you. Perhaps if you read some of Nicolai's writing, you will come to know St. Nicolai as I did. I had to read, otherwise I would go off on whatever. If you have any questions, maybe I could answer some of your questions. I'm so, going to not start by asking questions, but I'm going to explain what's behind you here. Oh, yes, you must do that. <laughs> this is an icon of St. Nikolai. It was, Saint, it was uh, commissioned by St. Tihans and is now in the shrine that they're making to Saint, to Saint Nikolai at Saint Tihon's. And what's really cool from my perspective, <laughs> in this corner is my dad, his executive secretary. Wow. So it's, it's kind of cool. And, and it's big. And the icon is really big, and when I first saw it, I cried. I said, oh my goodness, look at this. If you have any questions. <clears throat> any questions? Yes. I'm a little nervous to ask this, but could you tell us anything about a sense of humor that he had? That I mean, it's not often you get to ask about a saint, and did he have a sense of humor or describe his personality? But is that? <laughs> oh, is yes, that he did. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, he did. He was a person. He was a human being. And he just made you feel like you are something very special no matter who you are. Does that answer your question? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So what brought him from Serbia to the United States? What, why did he, well, what happened? he was from England, that's right. You said he came from England. Yes, he did, but the thing is, he was, um, uh, there were communists and the Germans fighting. So he left. Serbia. Where he was in Serbia, South Serbia. And he went to England from there. And no, no, he went first to um, um, I I forget the I forget the place in um, was it Germany? No, not in Germany, in Italy. Uh -huh. And uh, he was there with a whole group of Serbians. And then he went to to um, England, and then he went went to the United States. Yeah. He, he was very special. And you should have seen the look in his eyes when he was talking to you. He, not, he was just direct. It wasn't this way, it wasn't that way. And he was the one who said, besides Dostoevsky, the eyes are the mirror of the soul. Because if you're talking with a person and you're listening, you're really listening, you don't shift eyes like that. So he said, it's, it's in the soul. And that's the soul that carries you to the end where you're going to go. And there is a kingdom of heaven. There has to be a kingdom of heaven. I don't know how many of you might believe this, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how old was he? How, how old was he when he died? Because you were young. Uh, let's see. Uh, he was. Oh, I can't remember right now. I'm sorry. I mean, did he die? Yeah, they, so they say, and the priest there at St. Um, Tihans wanted to have an autopsy. The, the Serbian bishop said, no autopsy. <laughs> Why? 
Well, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? There are other stories. I don't know all the stories. And you can't say anything unless you really, really know. Any, and, other? any other questions? Yes. I, I, I can't hear. During the canonization process, during the canonization. were you a part of the canonization when he was, process? When he was canonized to a saint, were you part of the process? No. Yeah, she asked if you were part of the process, did they ask you any questions? No, 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 no. I think they wanted to avoid me. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't say much, yes. Yes. And you said that they found out later why that was. Can you tell us why that was? No, no, I, I think I better not. Okay. <laughs> I think I better not. You might read it around some time. Somebody will, will find out why. They were looking for something. And who, who would leave that upset like that? Yes. Do you know what was in the portfolio that he wanted to get to that author? Yes, he had writ written some manuscripts and he wanted them handwritten, and I also have some at home, and I told um, uh, Father, John. Father John Parker, who is uh, the, the, dean. Yeah, the dean up there, that I have to get that to him because it should be in the shrine, because they're handwritten, they're letters and whatever, and they're beautiful, they're absolutely beautiful, and the books that he named, The Only Lover of Mankind, and the harvest of the Lord. Those two are part of uh, a hymns in the liturgy. And during the liturgy, you only say I twice. I believe and I confess. The rest is we, ours, yours, theirs. The liturgy is, is, is absolutely magnificent. And it puts you almost like in a piece of heaven. It does for me. Yes, ma'am. You said you taught church school. Do you keep in touch with any of your former students? Are they working in the church anywhere? Do you know well, them? there is a young, young a man who got married. And I told him, I said, I'm going to give you a special gift. I asked him if he had a Bible. And he said, no. So I want to give him the Orthodox um, Study Bible. And there's other books that go with that. So when I get up to St. Tihon's, I will get that and send that to him. Good? So you can yeah, touch this yeah, right? yeah. And he, yes. Do you mind if I use the microphone to ask? Go ahead. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> My name's Nick, and I don't know if John Michael McCulloch remembers this, but I, I went to uh, summer camp as a kid at St. Tihon's. Oh. And so, of course, that was back when he was Bishop Nikolai and not Saint Nikolai. And I'll never forget, they told a story, and I want to see whether, I do believe the story, but, you know, anyway, they said that he was serving liturgy in the, in the church in St. Tihon's. And there were two older gentlemen who always used to like to wander out during liturgy and sit outside on the bench and have a smoke or something. Yeah. <laughs> and he had had enough of it. And in the middle of the liturgy, he stopped and he got his, <laughs> uh, got his staff and he just walked out of the church. And of course, the whole, I mean, you can imagine if you're the choir director, everything comes to a grinding halt. And everybody followed him because where the church, where the bishop is, the church is. So everybody comes out and he sits down on the bench and he just starts saying, oh, isn't this beautiful out here, the birds and everything? And they knew, don't ever do this again. <laughs> so I'm just asking, does, I don't know if you ever heard that story. Yes, I did. In line with, yes. Oh, you did, okay. <laughs> yes, I did. And as a matter of fact, my husband did the same thing. <laughs> and I said, he always called the liturgy... Um, Metaphysical surgery. Yeah, that, yeah. That is, he called it a metaphysical surgery. Because when, once you pass a certain part of the liturgy, it's like a surgeon. And he faints or he dies or whatever the priest, someone's got to finish it. It, it. it can't be left hanging in the air like that. 
So that's it. Any any other questions? But I think the story that he told matches here about him being a bit of a character at times. Yeah. So yes, he definitely was according to. <laughs> oh. I want. I was a little, you know, nervous coming up here, and I said, I can't just say it like that and look at all these peoples and look at their eyes looking at me, so I had to read it. And sometimes I get a little, you know, carried off, and I can't, and I can't help it. Yes, sir. It was wonderful, really. <clears throat> Thank you so much. else but I was listening to every word and uh, when Nick asked the question about the sense of humor I already knew the answer because he said and put my last name in and spell it right <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> okay that's now that's a voice of a saint who has already departed this world that's a sense of humor too <laughs> but I, I really I really think that he's in um, in heaven he's got to be I mean, how else could he come after several years of dying and then telling me what to do and how to do and all that? I said, I'm sorry I didn't bring that book with me. And I asked my uh, granddaughter, who is uh, an artist, if she would read some of those little stories and just write something, uh, or I mean, I mean, draw something, you're an artist. She said, no, I don't have to. Look in your book when you were traveling in, in Italy. And you will see that there's a picture there of an older woman looking out of a big window, and she's looking at the elements of the earth. She's looking at the blue sky, the white clouds, the mountains, the flowers, the gardens, the trees, and then below there is a lake. That's the one that goes. And I said, how do you remember that? It was so long ago. He said, it's just impressive. <laughs> so that's that. I don't have anything else to say. Thank you all. Okay.